thank you very much and good morning everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me at the back? I prefer to speak without a microphone so hopefully that will work all right for everybody. So I'm very pleased to be here, I'm pleased to see so many people on such a beautiful day and hopefully you'll enjoy a bit of Scotland as well in your time here. And thank you very much to Highland Titles for supporting Trees for Life and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak to you today. So Trees for Life is a conservation charity um, working in the glens to the west of Loch Ness and Inverness, so a bit north of here. Uh, we've been active for over 25 years and our goal, our vision is to restore um, a significant area of the Caledonian forest. That's the forest that used to cover most of the highlands of Scotland, characterised by the Scots pine. So I've got a bunch of slides and I'm going to talk through you today in this presentation this morning. And essentially the presentation is in three parts. The first part is an introduction to the forest and some of the species there. The second part is a bit about the history and how it's come to be in its present state today or recent state. And then the third part is the work that my charity has been involved with for since 1989, practical work of uh, natural regeneration and planting trees. And that, of course, is what Highland Times is supporting us with. So, this is a picture from Glen Affric. Anybody been to Glen Affric? Yeah. A few people have, yeah. yeah. Um, if you haven't been, I'd really strongly recommend it. Um, it's one of the most uh, magical places in the country. It's one of the few areas that gives a sense of what much of the Highlands must have been like in the past. It's got big mountains, it's got lots of water, locks and rivers, and it's got one of the best remnants of the old Caledonian forest. Anybody who's been there might recognize this. This is um, at uh, Dog Falls. So the Caledonian forest, um, typically on the left there, another picture from Glen Affric, and on the right, that's what's left in most, most parts of the country today. Or even worse than that, there's not even a dead pine left. Um, pines, if they die of old age, which many of them do because they're at the end of their lives, um, they'll often stay standing just as a skeleton like that for 50 or 100 years as a reminder of what's been lost. So those two photographs were taken about two kilometers apart in the same glen, showing two contrasting views of the highlands. So a bit about the Caledonian forest then. It's typified by the Scots pine, the trees you see here, the big ones, the big green ones. Most people know pine as a plantation tree these days where they stand in straight lines and look very uniform. But when they're given space to grow, they're as individual and unique as each person. The Scots pine is the most widely distributed conifer in the world. It grows from Scotland all the way to eastern Siberia, and it grows from north of the Arctic Circle to the Mediterranean. No other conifer has such a big range. But despite that, the pine woods of Scotland are unique because we have no other native conifers here. If you go to Norway, the nearest other pine woods, you find Norway spruce. Go to Russia, you find uh, firs and larches. But here we've only got pines. So the Caledonian forest pine woods are of international significance and they're a priority habitat under European Union um, Habitats and Species Directive. So the pine's the most important tree, but there's a range of species. Silver birch here in autumn is one of the most visible ones, turns a bright yellow. On the left here, we've got downy birch, which tends to grow further west where it's a bit wetter. And on the right, we've got rowan, producing lots of red berries in late summer. And both of those, plus the silver birch, are what we call pioneer species. So they're fast-growing, relatively short-lived trees, an early stage in the process of forest development. On the left, we've got another pioneer species here. This is aspen. Many people don't think of aspen, perhaps, as a Scottish tree. Uh, talk to people sometimes, they think of aspen as a ski resort in Colorado. <laughs> but in fact, um, it's actually one of our most important native trees, but it's very rare now, and I'll touch on that again a bit later. And on the right, we've got oak. And oak um, was more prevalent over here towards the west coast and also some parts of the east coast, but in the mountains where the pines dominate, the oaks penetrate up the glens on the southern slopes and better soil conditions. On the left here we've got juniper, not a tree as such, it's more a big shrub. It will grow maybe about the height of this room, um, but it's important as <coughs> a nesting site for birds. But it's really the Scots pine here on the right that's the backbone of the forest ecosystem. And that's because it's the largest tree in the forest to grow to 20 meters tall. And it's also the longest lived tree, uh, typically 300 years lifespan. But the oldest known pine in Scotland was aged at 550 years in 1997, not that far northwest of here. 
a bit older than that now. I've been to a pine in Norway, well north of any in Scotland, that was 720 years old. So we probably had pines that old in the past before we lost most of our forests. The forest is more than the trees though, it's an interdependent community of many different organisms and the trees provide the structural framework or the habitat for lots of other things to survive. For example here, these um, mounds are called hummocks and these develop over time on low boulders like this or over a tree stump, beginning with lichens here and then mosses come and then eventually you get the higher plants, these are um, blaeberry and cowberry here and they are shade loving plants so they need the canopy of the trees to develop and a hummock like this will take maybe a hundred years to develop like this you can just about see a bit of rock left there so when you see an old landscape like that of these rounded hummocks full of vegetation it's a sign the forest has been there undisturbed for probably centuries Fungi, very important in our forest and in all forests around the world, and they're one of the, the main um, components of the forest, apart from the trees that help to give the forest its structure, its stability, and its resilience. Fungi cannot use the sun's energy, they have no chlorophyll, but they wrap their little hypho, um, filaments um, around the roots of trees and an exchange of nutrients takes place. So that the trees harvest the sun's energy, produce sugars and carbohydrates, and pass them to the fungi underground. And in turn, the fungi, through their network of hyphae in the soil, access nutrients that the trees can't reach, and those then get passed to the trees. So there's this symbiosis, this mutually beneficial relationship going on invisibly underground all the time in the forest. And the only evidence of it is in late summer or early autumn when the fruits of the fungi appear. Now, most people think of these as mushrooms, and that's a fungus. That's actually only the fruiting body. The main part of the fungus is these white filaments in the soil there all the time. And every forest in the world has this sort of relationship and other terrestrial ecosystems too. Grasslands and savannas have similar fungi. So that's one of the key things that makes the, the forest, um, gives us its, resili its resilience. And fungi are part of the food web. This is a black slug. You can just about see its optical antenna there. And it's got its head in its food. It's actually eating in, 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 inside its food, the fly agaric fungus here. And the slug might be eaten by a small bird or a mammal, which could be eaten by a, an eagle or something like that. So you begin to see how the flow of nutrients works in the ecosystem. Some other interesting features of our forest. Um, here on the left, this is a rowan sapling. It's taken in early autumn, so the rowan leaves are just turning uh, so orangey red. And it's growing here at the fork of a big branch on an old Scots pine, what we call a granny pine, a big one. And it's growing right in the crevice there. And what happens with rowan is the berries get eaten by birds in late summer. And the bird digests the fruit, the pulp of the berry, and the seeds pass through the bird's digestive system and get deposited in their droppings. So a bird was perching high up on this tree, its dropping fell there, and this little rowan got established. This is quite common. I climbed up a, a Scots pine into the canopy in Glen Affric about 10 years ago and counted 11 rowans in the canopy of one old pine. Most of them have no future though. They're destined to remain a bonsai like this because there's no soil there. But just occasionally, one of them gets lucky and that's what's happened here. This smooth barked tree on the right is a rowan and it's growing in this case on a rougher barked alder on the left here and it probably germinated about here and it sent up its leader shoot here and it managed to get a root down the side of the alder tree to the ground and once it reached the ground it was able to get access to nutrients and it's grown like this using the alder for support now that looks exactly like how fig trees grow in the tropics so we've got lots of interesting things that many people don't perhaps know about so much here's the berry plants blaeberry on the left delicious to eat enjoyed by people enjoyed by pine martens, by deer, lots of other animals, and in the past by bears, when we had bears in Scotland. And on the right we've got cowberry, which is a related species, evergreen. Berries are rather sour though, so not many people eat them. A couple of special plants, flowering plants. On the left here we've got twin flower, has this beautiful Y-shaped um, stem with one single blossom at the end, that's how it gets its name. And uh, that plant is um, 
across all around the Northern Hemisphere in, in boreal forests. So you get it in Canada, you get it in North America, you get it in Scandinavia. And in those countries, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere in the forest. It's hard to step without, hard to walk without stepping on them. In Scotland, it's extremely rare. There's very few sites where it survives. And it's another victim of deforestation. It spreads mostly by runners, and it's highly susceptible to disturbance and fire. So when it gets cleared from an area, it won't recover because it doesn't seed very often. On the right, we've got creeping ladies' tresses, which is an orchid, also spreads by runners. And this one is more common flowers in late summer when the heather's out, and uh, you can also find it in some plantations, but the, the Catalonian forest is its main stronghold. Moving on up to other life in the forest, uh, we've got lots of insects. These are wood ants here. These are almost a centimeter long, dark bodied, and this is them on the trunk of a pine tree. This is their nest, and they build these mounds. They can be up to a meter high with half a million ants in them. The nest can be there for a century or more. And they're very important in the forest because the ants will climb up the trunk of all the big pines, go out to the tips of the branches where they look for caterpillars that eat the needles of the pine trees. And they do the same thing for broadleaf trees too. And they take the caterpillars back to their nest to feed to their young. So they prevent the tree from suffering excessive defoliation. They also use the fallen needles to make their nests. So again, they get this mutually beneficial relationship. Now, uh, just driving here today, I was noticing since the last time I was down here, there's lots of solar panels on some of the buildings around here. And, you know, everybody's interested in renewable energy these days. Well, we're, we're just catching up with the wood ants because they've been using solar energy for millions of years. Their nests are always made with the main slope facing south so they can utilize the sun's energy. And uh, well, probably not now, but maybe last month, if you'd been here, been out in the woodlands and saw a wood ant nest, on a cold morning when the sun comes out, you see the ants sitting on top of the nest all together. And they've got dark bodies, so they sunbathe and they heat up in the sun and then they go into their nest and radiate the heat into their chambers where their larvae are developing. So they regulate their own temperature using the sun's energy. They're also farmers, which I'll come back to later. So we've got lots of insects. Moths are particularly prevalent in our woodlands and many of them are very well camouflaged. And that's because moths are active mostly at night. In the day, they're sedentary, they sit still, so they have to rely on camouflage to avoid getting eaten by birds. So this here, the lesser swallow prominent, is perched on a birch tree, and you can see the coloration matches the bark of the birch very well indeed. There's also a moth in the other picture. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's right here. That's the dark marbled carpet moth. That's its head, there's an antenna, that's the tip of one wing, and that's the tip of the other wing. And it's on the bark of Scots pine, this is the bark, the plates of the bark, and that's lichen. And you can see it's almost invisible. The only reason I took this photograph was I was standing looking at the tree, and the moth landed in front of my eyes, otherwise I would never have seen it. So I don't know if you're like me, if you ever watch, you know, nature documentaries on television about tropical rainforests, and they always show these sort of images of perfectly camouflaged insects that look like orchid blossoms or uh, dead leaves. Well, we have similar things in Scotland, but they don't make many um, nature documentaries about the dark marbled carpet moth. It's somehow not very attractive for filmmakers. So insects are food for birds. We've got lots of birds. Um, great spotty woodpecker here at its nest in an aspen tree. And you can just about make out it's got some grubs in its beak there. This is the crested tit one of three characteristic birds of the Caledonian forest. Um, this one likes to nest in dead pines. Uh, one of the others is the Scottish crossbill, the only bird endemic to Scotland, meaning it occurs in Scotland and nowhere else. And then the third one is this, the capercaillie, the largest grouse in the world. This is a male in um, breeding display, lecking in April. And uh, he fluffs up his neck feathers, as you can see, fans out his tail and makes a very distinctive sound. Capricale is Gallic, it means horse of the woods, because the sound he makes apparently reminded people in the past of the metallic sound of um, all the sort of harnesses and things that horses wore. So um, the Capricale has the sad distinction of having been hunted to extinction in Scotland in the past. It was wiped out in the late 1700s, um, hunted to extinction. But birds were brought over from Scandinavia in the 1830s, and it was successfully uh, re-established. So we've got Capricales again, but their numbers have been in decline for the past 20 years or so. 
for reasons that are not fully understood. And if we can't reverse that, this bird has the likely fate of going extinct in Scotland for the second time, which would be very sad indeed. We've then got lots of mammals in the forest, everything from mice and voles, badgers, foxes, um, so these, these are two of the more distinctive ones, the red squirrel here on the left, the Caledonian forest and the highlands of Scotland are the main stronghold for the red squirrel in Britain, and uh, it's been displaced from most of southern Britain by the non-native grey squirrel introduced from North America. So we've, we've, we're the stronghold here in Scotland. And then we've also got uh, the pine marten, and uh, that was hunted to very low numbers in the last century, but after persecution was stopped, its population has rebounded. And I don't know if any of you are aware, there's been some interesting research done recently in Ireland, which has shown that because of the recovery of pine martens there, um, it's tipped the balance away from grey squirrels in favour of red squirrels. The grey squirrel is not used to a pine martin as a predator because they don't have them in North America where it comes from. And they're also a bit bigger and spend more time on the ground, so they're more vulnerable to pine martens. So where pine martens have returned in Ireland, the greys are in retreat and the reds are expanding the range again. So we're just about to engage in research to see if the same is happening in Scotland. So these two guys, although the pine martin will take squirrels, uh, they're actually you know, potentially a friend of the squirrel as well. And then we have this, the red deer, which is our largest surviving land mammal in Scotland today. Um, nowadays it's mostly thought of as an animal of the open hillside but it actually its native habitat is the forest and it should live in the woodland. But in the absence of trees, it's adapted to live in an impoverished environment. So it occurs on the hillsides, but it typically grows only about two thirds of the size that it does elsewhere in its range, which includes Europe and North America, where it's called elk, but it's the same species, Cervus elaphus. And uh, we used to have bigger deer in Scotland too. Preserved specimens have been found in peat bogs bigger than any living today. <laughs> So there's often perceived this conflict between trees and deer in Scotland. And it's not really a conflict, it's an artificial situation. The two belong together. And if we had more trees and better habitat, we could have healthier and bigger deer. This is not a Scottish photograph, <laughs> uh, I hasten to add. And I took this in Canada many years ago. Um, but I put it in here to symbolize what we've lost, because we've lost most of our large mammals. Um, the bear probably gone for a thousand years, we've lost the wolf, we've lost um, the beaver until recently, wild boar, the lynx, the wolf, um, those have all vanished over time because largely due to habitat loss or hunting pressure. So that's a very quick snapshot of some features of the forest. Um, there's very little of it left today, solitary trees like this are a common sight and that's not a very big tree but I can tell you it's, all, it's not a very young tree either, it's quite old. Uh, it's just in an exposed position. So when the forest is reduced to a single tree like that, no squirrel can live there. No um, blaberries can grow under it. There's not enough shade. Um, basically, you take away the trees, all the things I've showed you, they lose their habitat. And this is taken about 400 meters from the previous photograph. The previous one was just over the ridge. So this is the front line of where the forest loss is still happening in Glen Affric, which is a national nature reserve. You know, we've still got this problem today. It's being addressed in some areas, but many parts of these old woodlands are still in decline. And if you go any glen in Scotland, particularly in the north and west, and you look around in the treeless landscapes, you'll find a scene like this. This is a forest cemetery. It's a tree graveyard. These are stumps of old pines. In some cases, they're very old. They've been dated to 4,000 years old in some cases because the peat acts as a natural preservative. But in other cases, like these ones here at the front, here they're sticking up through the grass, they're not buried in the peat. These were probably alive 100 years ago. And you can see there's not a living tree in sight anywhere in that photograph. And um, I don't know if any of you get publications from the Scottish Tourist Board, or even if you watch Hollywood movies like Braveheart, you know, they always show these beautiful wide open green landscapes, you know, with not a tree in sight, and it's like, come to beautiful Scotland. Well, the reality is there is a beauty to it, but it's a highly depleted beauty because what's, what was there in the past is gone. The wildlife is gone, the forest is gone, and indeed in many places the people are gone too. 
and some of you may perhaps know about the Highland Clearances of um, the latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century where people were forcibly moved off the land and sheep were brought in in large numbers. So deforestation has been happening in Scotland for a long time. It's not something of the last 20 years. It's not even something of the past 200 years. It's more like two, three, four thousand years it's been going on. And it probably happened um, over a long period of time, starting not long after the Ice Age finished. <coughs> this shows the estimated maximum extent of the native pine woods of Scotland, uh, probably about four or five thousand years ago. This is how much they covered. And these dark blobs here are the remnants that are left today. And that's the area where Trees for Life is focusing its efforts. If you're wondering why there's a big gap down there, that's the Great Glen. And it's mostly water, so there were never trees there. So you can see graphically, you know, we've got a tiny percentage. It's one, two, three percent, something of that range is all we've got left. It's been gone for a long time. Um, it's not something recent. It's probably um, started back in um, Neolithic times. People just cutting down the trees to create a bit of pasture, to get wood for fires, for tools, for building houses, making boats, that sort of thing. But cumulatively over time it added up. And it reached a critical point of no return about 200 years ago. Because at that stage, um, there's been, since then, there's been no recruitment of young trees. The old trees still produce seed. They germinate but we've had too many animals eating the seedlings and too few seedlings produced. So we've got an ecosystem completely out of balance. And um, deer numbers, for example, this is red deer here. Deer numbers have more than doubled in the past 40 years in Scotland. And today, we still have more sheep than people in the country. We have about 5.3 million people in Scotland and we have 6 million sheep. And those herbivores eat everything. That's just what they do, they've got to live, they've got to survive. So you find this is a very common landscape here, a group of stags here on the valley bottom. And if you look, you see there's two or three trees growing out of rocks there. And if you travel around Scotland, some of you probably have many times, you'll see a very common sight, you see a solitary tree growing out of a rock. And that's because that's the only place they grow without getting eaten. And here, this is a sheep in a piece of pine woodland. And you can see that's actually heather, that dark stuff on the forest floor. It's heather about one centimeter high, grazed down to virtually nothing. And you can see there's no evidence of um, blaberries or anything else there at all. So we've got this ecosystem that's really out of balance. The trees produce seed, the seeds germinate, and in the winter is the critical time. If they get up a little bit at all, they stick their heads above the snow like this, they're a target. The deer come into the woodlands in winter for shelter, looking for food, and anything green that sticks up above the snow gets eaten. So here on the left, this is a heavily overgrazed pine seedling. This is in Glen Affric, and you can see it's just got a handful of needles left in this photograph. It's been eaten back repeatedly. And in fact, I photographed this tree over a number of years, and about a month after this picture, it was dead. And the next time I went out, all the needles were gone. By contrast, this is a healthy seedling here, and it's got a good leader shoot, it's got a healthy growth of needles, it's got a future because it's inside a fenced area where no deer can reach it. Pines are the tree of last resort that they will eat though. Pine needles, you can imagine, they're pretty tough and spiky, they don't taste very good, and it's a bit like getting acupuncture on your tongue, you know, prickly. So they have to be desperate to eat pines, but rowan is something they'll eat much more readily. And this is a particular clump of rowans I've been photographing, as you can see, for over 20 years. And when the first photograph was taken in October 1992, you can see already there is evidence of browsing pressure. And that there, those little stumps are showing where it's been eaten back. And you can see over the following years, every four years or so, I take a photograph. In 2012, they were actually smaller than they were 20 years previously. Negative growth in 20 years. And if you look, you'll see there's not a living tree in the background in that picture. One deer in that landscape will find a rowan because it's the most palatable of all trees and will eat it. And there's no chance for forest recovery in a place like that. We've reduced the ecosystem to its bare minimum. And because of the way we utilize land in Scotland and the large numbers of herbivores we maintain, um, things cannot recover. So this is very common. Back to Glen Africa again, the main part of Glen Africa. 
Um, this is um, a gully here, and you can see heather covered slopes, ideal for trees, nothing there. The only place they survive is on the steep ground where the animals can't reach them. So that's the problem. That's what we've inherited from past generations. And I don't blame anybody for that. It's just, you know, I think people had to survive and they did what they needed. But we've got a choice. We're better educated, we're a wealthier country, and we can choose to do things differently now. And experimental work has been going on for the past 30, 40 years. This is a project here initiated by what was then the Nature Conservancy Council, now called Scottish Natural Heritage, in Strathfara, two glens north of Africa. They put up this fence in 1980 to keep deer out. And this photograph taken seven years later, you can see all these little pines here. Nobody planted those. Those are the naturally occurring seedlings from the old trees in the background. And outside the fence, there were just as many still getting eaten by deer. And that's the same area photographed in um, 2009. That fence post there is that fence post there. And you can see the fence has been taken down. The trees are so big, the deer can't harm them anymore. And there's even birch coming in there too. So it's actually very simple. The natural condition of most of the land in the highlands of Scotland would be covered in forest. If you look at our latitude, 55 to 57 degrees north, all around the world, you go to North America, it's Alaska, it's Canada. You go to Asia, it's Siberia, it's Russia, it's Scandinavia. It's forest everywhere. It's the biggest forest in the world. And given a chance, the land will recover by itself. 10,000 years ago, we had no trees in Scotland because the country had been covered by ice for 90,000 years. And when the climate warmed up, the ice melted, the forest recovered by itself. Trees came, birds, insects came, people came. The same thing would happen now if we weren't interfering with it and preventing it. And this is being documented in other parts of the world. This is what's called ecological restoration. It's the ability of ecosystems, of the land itself, to recover from disturbance, from wounds, if you like. This is Mount St. Helens. Anybody know Mount St. Helens in Washington State, in the US, and one or two people? Spectacular eruption in 1980 blanketed a huge area of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest with ash and blew down the trees like matchsticks. Thirteen years later when I visited, young trees were already eight feet tall and I watched chipmunks, which are like squirrels but live on the ground, running along these logs, their cheeks bulging with seeds because they stash the seeds and they never find them all. And that's part of the natural recovery process. So that's being monitored and studied. And it's working there because there's a healthy, intact ecosystem around it. And that's what we don't have in Scotland. So that's why groups like Trees for Life have sprung up to help that natural recovery process. And our project is all about working with nature, helping nature to do what nature would like to do in the Highlands of Scotland. So the final part then is to talk a bit about our work. This is some of the first trees we planted. Uh, back in 1991, uh, but we didn't start with planting, we started with natural regeneration because that's the best way to help the forest recover. Some of you might recognize this gentleman, David yeah. Bellamy, uh, not so well known these days, but uh, in 1991 uh, he was in the media a lot and we managed to get him to come and close the gate on a 50 hectare fence that we put up in partnership with Forestry Commission Scotland in Glen Affric. I'd raised enough money by that time to pay for a fence. The Forestry Commission had land but no money. Uh, their budget had been cut. And um, we came together as slightly unlikely partners, I would say. <laughs> the Forestry Commission being the experts, and me certainly uh, wasn't an expert in those days, but um, we've had a very successful partnership for 25 years, and we've achieved a lot together. So this was the first thing, 50 hectares. We'd chosen that area on the edge of the woodland because there were old trees there, you can see a few and lots of open ground. And we had a student from Edinburgh University study the area before the fence went up. He found an estimated 100,000 pine seedlings in 50 hectares, self-seeded from the old trees. Average age, 9.9 .9 years old, and average height, eight and a half centimeters, which is a bit smaller than this. So 10-year-old trees were this height. And that was because 95% of them had grazing damage. So what's happened since then? Well, that's what I looked like back in the early 1990s. <laughs> you can see why it was a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a miracle the Forestry Commission agreed to a partnership. Anyway, I'm standing here, this is in 1992, inside the fence, two years after the fence went up, 
This is the first signs of regeneration. That's a hummock I talked about earlier with blaberries on it. And when the fence went up, the tree was held at the height of the blaberries there. So the stem was 1990s growth, the needles were 91s growth, and the candles or buds that you can just see there were the growth of 1992. That's the same tree photographed in 2012. And you can see it dwarfs me now. And the fence has got uh, special markers on it to avoid collisions with black grouse. So all we've done there is keep the deer out and the forest is recovered. And this, I think, is even more dramatic. It's the same area, but you can't see the fence because it's in the middle of the area. And in 1989, before the fence went up, the forest was dying. You can see some living trees in the background, but these three snags or skeletons there you know, were evidence of the forest disappearing. Now, as mentioned earlier, they persist for a long time. Well, look at this here. That's 25 years after that photograph, and that skeleton there is virtually unchanged. Pine has a lot of resin in its wood, and when the tree dies standing, that acts as a natural preservative. So this is a very potent symbol for me, because here the forest was dying, and here these young trees, again, natural regeneration, we didn't need to plant them, they're now bigger than the dead ones. So we've actually been able to reverse that process of forest decline. We've drawn a line with the fence and said, this is as far as the forest shrinks, let's turn the tide and help it recover again. And it's actually very simple. You know, nature does most of the work if we give her the opportunity. There's a couple of other pictures of regeneration. The same area again, there's the fence in this photograph. This pine here died after the fence went up. I didn't literally watch it die, but I noticed over the years that it died. <laughs> And uh, here there's lots of birch coming away and there's a holly there. And then this is a different area, also in Glen Affric with the Forestry Commission, one of my former colleagues. There's birch here, there's rowan, um, there's bog myrtle, there's ferns, and there's heather blooming. And you can see that looks almost like a garden in comparison to some of the desolate landscapes I showed earlier. So natural regeneration is the best method, but that only works if you've got a seed source, if there's old trees nearby that will produce seeds. And in most of the highlands, there are no trees nearby. So that's why we plant trees too. Because if we waited just for natural regeneration, it would be a slow process. So we want to assist and accelerate it. So we've been collecting seeds for 25 years. This is a volunteer collecting a pine cone there. And we extract the seeds and grow on trees, some in our own nursery, some in commercial nurseries and then we plant them out. And we started planting in 1991. And in 2012, three years ago, we reached a sort of milestone of one million trees. We're now up about 1.3 million, I think. And people of all ages come, we've had children, we've had people in their 70s come and work with us. And uh, almost all our work is done by volunteers and there is some information about volunteering if anybody is interested. So just to show you tree planting and the effect of that, this was our very first tree planting week in 1991. April. That man there was one of our first volunteers, I still remember him, Grant McFarlane. He's holding a pine seedling on his planting bag there, and we was about to plant next to this old stump. And when we plant, we don't plant in straight lines, we don't plant in regular patterns. We seek to mimic how the forest would grow naturally. So we look for places where pines would do well. This is obviously one, that's not a tree that was buried in the peat, it was cut down probably in the 19th century. So we plant there. This is the same scene um, in 11 years later. And you can see the stump, it's almost covered over by not just trees, but vegetation. That's the tree he planted. But look here, all the roots that were exposed there have now been covered over by heather. The heather there was half a centimeter tall, cropped by deer. Keep the deer out, the trees grow, and the heather grows. And if you look carefully here, you'll see this is the start of the hummock formation process I described earlier a bit of blavery coming on the top of that stump. And that's the same scene um, 20 years after the tree was planted. The stump is now invisible behind the heather. So you can see the transformation of the landscape. This, I think, shows it even more clearly. This is the same area, uh, the first plantings that we did in 1991. And again, all planting has to be done inside fences, otherwise the deer feast on the baby trees. And you can see here the pines that have been planted irregularly spaced, so clumps and openings and gaps in between. But look at this, heather flowering here, and this is bog myrtle. And outside we've got peat hags and grass. <coughs> peat hags are a terminal state of decline of an ecosystem, where the elements <coughs> expose the underlying peat, 
and you get the erosion. And if you jump into one of these, you can sink up to your knees in thick, black, sticky, wet peat. Very difficult to hike around in these areas like that. Well, that peat hag extended inside here. It's now revegetated naturally. So a peat hag is an open wound. It's a running sore in the land. And when we stop the grazing, overgrazing pressure, we get succession happening. Grasses are adapted to grazing. If an animal eats grass, you know, it sprouts again from the base. That's what grasses do. If an animal eats heather, it dies. It won't grow, it won't sprout again. So when we stop the grazing, we get succession from grass to heather. And in heather, we get the pioneer species coming of their own accord. And in this area, we've got that. We didn't need to plant them. And then the other trees, you know, will come afterwards. So when we redress the imbalance, we begin to get the natural process of recovery happening. So when the trees grow, the wildlife returns. <coughs> this is the same area. Um, that's eared willow with a green hair streak butterfly feeding on it. We didn't plant the willow. The seed got blown in by the wind. Another pioneer species growing and providing a food source for a butterfly. This is a heather fly on one of the pines we've planted. And this is a crested tit on one of the trees in the area we protected for regeneration. So as soon as the trees recover and the forest and the vegetation grows, wildlife moves in. And um, this particular area here where we planted the trees, I was out there two weeks ago and there's now black grouse living there. They've been able to spread one of the endangered species in Scotland. They've been able to spread because they've got a habitat for them again. So we started work with pines. Uh, we work with all the native trees. Aspen I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is Aspen here, one of our staff members surveying them. And we've done the biggest survey for Aspen in Scotland. Aspen is an interesting tree because it supports a very uh, unique range of other species. Mosses, lichens and rare insects. Some of which are very rare indeed. And aspen is also unusual because it hardly ever flowers and produces seeds. Its main method of reproduction is uh, the roots of a parent tree will send up a new shoot, sometimes 50 meters away from the parent. And it's grown on the same root system, so it's actually the same tree. So if you look at a clump of aspen trees like this, you can see they're in a straight line here because they've all grown off the roots of the one original tree. And what that means is um, aspen is also dioecious, so aspen is either male or female, not both. But most trees, pine, birch, oak, have male and female on the bone on the same tree. I'm getting a bit of competition here. Um, aspen is either male or female, so all these trees here would either be male or female. The next stand of aspen might be miles away, it could even be the same sex. So that's why we hardly ever get seeds. So what do you do with aspen then? When it's gone from an area, it will never get back because it's got no seeds. So we dig up root sections like this and we propagate them in our nursery. They send up young shoots which can then be um, severed individually and rooted on, potted in individual pots like this here, and then plant them out. So we've been doing this. We're kind of the leading organization working with Aspen. And uh, we do, we've done about 30,000 Aspen this way over the years now. It's quite a labor intensive operation. And aspen is also very important because it's one of the main winter foods for the European beaver. And some of you, I'm sure, are very well aware of the fact that there's been a trial beaver reintroduction going on in Argyll in Scotland for the past five years. And there's also another population of beavers in the Tay near Perth. And this year, the government is going to make a decision about whether further reintroductions will be allowed in Scotland. So we've been supporting that for a number of years and planting aspen to make sure that we've got enough habitat for beavers if we do get more reintroductions. Aspen is a pioneer species that so grows very quickly. That one grew that much in six years, quite remarkable. And this is one of the species associated with aspen. Again, another excellent example of camouflage. This is the poplar hawk moth uh, caterpillar. And you can see here the pattern of veins on its body matches the veins in the leaves. The spots match the spots on the leaf itself, and it's even got this little horn, which is a bit like the petiole, the leaf stem. Superb camouflage. And we also work with aspen suckers, and those are the, the shoots that come off the, the roots of a parent tree. Now, if you plant a tree seedling somewhere for the first two or three years, very little happens because it's busy developing roots. You protect a sucker like this, it's got all the roots of a parent tree to feed it, so they grow very quickly. And this one grew four feet in ten weeks. That's a tropical rate of growth. You know, no other tree does that in Scotland. 
But what was remarkable, not only did it grow that much in 10 weeks, but it actually was supporting two species of invertebrates. Here, I don't know if you can see at the back, but these little brown blobs are aphids. It's a species called Pterocoma tremuli, and it's specific to, uh, to aspen. It doesn't feed on other trees. And they suck the sap of aspen, and they secrete a clear liquid called honeydew as a waste product. And that honeydew is one of the main foods of wood ants, which you see here. There's a couple of wood ants tending them. And the, the ants actually stroke the aphids with their antennae to stimulate them to produce the honeydew. They'll also protect the aphids from predators and parasites, and they even pick up the aphids in their jaws and move them around to different feeding spots on the tree. So I said earlier, the ants are farmers. This is what they do, they farm aphids. So the point I'm making here is when you bring something back in the ecosystem, you return new life to it, lots of other things benefit. So we work with other trees too, this is oak, not many oaks in places like Glen Affric, so they produce good seeds so we protect them with tubes like this. Same thing with hazel here, you can see a sequence, you know, protection, and then eventually when it's big enough the guard can be removed. This is riparian woodland, very important because the riparian woodland is the trees that grows along the edges of watercourses, of um, rivers and burns and also locks, and those trees are typically deciduous. They stabilize the banks of rivers, and they also produce leaves that fall into the water in autumn. And those leaves decompose and provide food for aquatic invertebrates. Caddisflies, mayflies, stoneflies, things like that. And they feed on the rotting tree leaves, and they in turn are food for fish. So having healthy riparian woodland is actually good for fish. So we have very little of that. This is the upper Afric River. You can see there's one tree in the background there. Everything else has been lost, so this is eared willow. We protect it with a small stock fence, and then when the fence is big enough, we can take it down. When the tree is big enough, we can take it down. We also work with the tree line community. Now, Scotland, because of its elevation, um, has a lot of high ground that's above the range of trees. And where the trees peter out on the hillside, you've got a scrub zone at the limit of the trees at the top edge. And that typically consists of dwarf, stunted trees, um, what are called Krumholtz pines, they grow maybe about this high or so, very twisted and gnarled, and some special species like dwarf birch. And that's a shrub um, which grows typically about waist height, but there's very little of it in good condition in Scotland today, because that tree line community is growing at high elevation, it's exposed, it's uh, vulnerable to wind, so it grows slowly, and any shrub that grows up is just at dinner table height for deer. So it's almost completely vanished. And most of what we find is scenes like this. This is dwarf birch here, literally stunted um, by overgrazing. So we protect that, which allows it to flower like this. And then we find lots of interesting species there. This is a sawfly caterpillar or larva, Amaronomatus tristis, never recorded in the UK until we found it on our land at Dundragon in an area of dwarf birch that we protected. So again, we're creating habitat for interesting things. Something else we do, which might seem a bit odd, um, is we cut down trees. Because some of the best remnants of the old Caledonian forest were underplanted with commercial crops of timber trees, non-native ones like Sitka spruce from North America in the 60s and 70s when there was a big push to get more timber in Britain. Sitka spruce is the most numerous tree in Scotland. There's more of it than any of our native trees. It's the mainstay of the timber industry, and that's fine, that's not a problem for me. But what I'm not happy with is the fact that some of our tiny remnants of the old forest have been underplanted. And this is what happens. There's an old pine there. There's a dead birch there. And look at this dense black wall of Sitka spruce, planted a metre apart. Spruce has tighter needles than pine, so it doesn't let any light in. Not even moss grows underneath there. And they grow faster than the pine. So if nothing was done, this area of pine wood would become another tree plantation. So we've been working with the Forestry Commission in particular for nearly 30 years now, cutting down these non-native trees in our old pine wood remnants. And that's really important if we want to maintain these special areas. We also work with rhododendrons as well in some places. We do a lot of work with biodiversity. So we have surveyors out. Um, this man on the left is a moth specialist. That's his moth trap there. And we also got lots of student projects. This woman did a PhD at Cambridge in England uh, on the nutrient uptake and the growth of pines that we've planted. 
Some more biodiversity things. More camouflage here on the left. Spot the spider. Right here. This is the lichen running spider, Philodromus margaritatus, on Cudbear lichen. Biodiversity action plan species, a priority for conservation. It's on our land at Dundragon. And this is another <coughs> sawfly, uh, never recorded in the UK before, found in our land. So Dundragon is where, um, it's the land that we own. We do a lot of work in other people's land with the Forestry Commission, RSPB and uh, National Trust for Scotland, but we own 10,000 acres ourselves in Glen Morriston. Uh, this is it here. It's got about 250 acres of mostly birch woodland, although there are some pines. So we've been planting trees there. Um, and this is a woman from Plymouth University who's doing canopy research. Nobody has looked at the canopy of our forests in Scotland before. We might well find interesting things there. And a few other things. We're doing a million more trees in five years and pine wood uh, protection in Glen Strathbarra. We also have a, an experimental project with wild boar, one of our missing animals. And these are ones, they're not truly wild because they're inside a fence in our woodland. So uh, we've got them there for their ecological purpose. And all our big mammals are missing, and that means their function in the ecosystem is absent as well. So boar churn up the soil, they root around, and here you can see literally clods of earth flying as this one is rooting around. And one of the things they do is they eat the roots of bracken, which is this here. Now bracken is a natural part of our ecosystem, but in the absence of its natural control, the boar, it is spread out of control in many areas of the country. And that's because the fronds are toxic to most animals. Nothing eats the fronds. And um, the critical thing for controlling bracken is the rhizomes, the underground runners. If you pull up a frond of bracken, it comes up without any roots. And the, the runner, the rhizome underground, will send up another frond. Pull that up, it will send up another one. The only way is to do something with the rhizomes. So the boar eat the rhizomes, and the ones they don't eat get exposed to the air, and frost then kills them. So that's a natural check on bracken. But what we found with the boar was within a day of their return, an unexpected ecological relationship got re-established. Now, some of you, I imagine, are gardeners. And if, like me, you're digging your garden at this time of year, you'll notice that robins come and follow people around looking for worms and grubs and things. Well, people are substitutes for their original partners, which are the boar. And within 24 hours of us having boar back at Dundragon, robins began following them around. And this was the winter of 2009, which is a particularly cold winter in Scotland. Uh, we had a lot of snow, and you can see the robins were desperate to get into the ground like this here to find things to eat. This is well known in continental Europe, where boar have always existed. The boar are followed constantly by robins. So again, when we bring one piece of the ecosystem back in place, other things benefit automatically, and you get these relationships re-established. This is where we work. That's Loch Ness. Inverness is up there. We're down somewhere about here, probably, at the moment. Um, Glen Affric is there. Uh, Strathfara, I talked about, is there. And Dundragon is here. And this is the road that goes from Loch Ness over to Skye. So it's about a thousand square miles. We picked that area initially because it's roadless. Uh, there's no towns or villages in there. There's one or two small settlements on the boundary. It's got some of the best forest remnants and it's got very little other land use taking place, so there's a real chance to do something on a significant scale to reconnect the fragments of woodland, and it would be big enough to support the populations of missing species that we'd like to reintroduce, boar, beaver, lynx, and so forth. We're now working beyond that as well, um, but that's where we focus most of our efforts to date. So just to summarize then, protection of forests through regeneration, collecting seed and planting trees, removal of fences and non-native species, and special projects for rare species like aspen. And almost all our work is done by volunteers. So our goals are restore the forest to a thousand square miles, link up existing remnants to create a larger tract of continuous woodland. That's essential to provide habitat for uh, uh, bigger species. Recovery of the surviving species that are threatened, red squirrel, wood ants, capercaillie, twin flower and reintroduction of the missing ones, including the predators. So we have a 250 year vision. I invite you to imagine a landscape like this. These old pines are 250 years old, and it's going to take 250 years to get a new generation of old trees in Scotland. Because these old ones now are at the end of their lives. 
and trees like this will be gone in 50 years. And one of the sad things for people in probably the next generation is they're not going to see many old trees like this because they're dying. They're going to see lots of young trees that Trees for Life are planting, that Highland Titles are planting, other organizations are planting, but it's going to be 150 years or so before they start to look like this again. So it's a long-term vision. It's a long-term project, and we have to start thinking that way again because so many of the problems in the world today, in my view, are determined by short-term thinking. The end of the financial year or the next election is most people's horizon. We have to learn to think on ecological timescales again. And this work of restoration is also very important because it's about giving something back to nature, giving something back to the land. The history of human civilizations has been of taking from nature. And we obviously need to take from nature. You know, I need to eat food, I need clothes, I need energy, all those things. But we have to learn to give something back in return. And that's particularly true in a place like Scotland, where we've taken so much and you know, the land has become depleted. So those are our contact details. There is some information that's been circulated. 